It's one thing to say, practice what you preach. It's another thing to do it. That's this week on Motoring 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. This week we're in the beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia, a place that loves nature, condos, but hates the car. And if you've ever driven here, you'll understand why. There's no quick way to get from point A to point B. That results in traffic jams, which results in more idling, which produces more pollution. Well, you know, is there any reason to believe that maybe it's time for cities to embrace the car rather than fight it? Well, this week, we're going to learn about a couple of Canadian cities with a definite pollution problem who have already shown that that is the way to go. This is the first annual Green Fleet Expo. It's an opportunity being presented by the City of Hamilton, City of Toronto and Fleet Challenge Ontario to introduce Green Fleet technology to fleet managers and their staff from other municipalities and organizations who are interested in greening their own fleets, reducing engine exhaust emissions and reducing the amount of fuel that they use. This technology has been in use in both Toronto and Hamilton for several years now. We started with our first hybrid electric vehicles uh, almost four years ago. Since then we've also been using uh, renewable fuels such as biodiesel and ethanol uh, fuel in the city fleets, uh, particularly in Toronto. We've got a, a wide variety of cars here that represent all the different technologies that are being used right now to green the City of Hamilton and City of Toronto fleets. So we've got hybrid electric vehicles here including Toyota Prius, we have the Chev Silverado hybrid pickup truck, the Ford Escape utility vehicle, the Honda Civic. Uh, hybrid vehicle. We've got natural gas vehicles here that are in use in the City of Toronto's fleet. Uh, we've got uh, some static displays here as well of other types of technologies that are in use. There's a diesel electric hybrid bus uh, that started to be used by the TTC for example. Well right now our, our hybrid fleet is still growing. We plan we have 50, 44 in the fleet right now. Uh, we plan for another 44 purchases this year and um, what we're doing is every time a vehicle comes due for replacement, we are looking at the possibilities of how we can make that replacement a greener vehicle. This is an aftermarket kit that we install uh, with the existing hybrid vehicles. We have one for the Toyota Prius and one for the Ford Escape. This is a 2005 Toyota Prius and it's still a gasoline powered vehicle. In a city, you can actually go in electric mode for one or two miles. What our company have done is we added a bigger battery to this Prius, making it to a plug-in hybrid. If you have a, a commute less than 30 miles a day, you come home, you plug in on a standard 110 outlet, and you'll never have to use gasoline again because this will give you that range. So it's a simple installation. It goes right on the trunk space where the spare tire locates. It drops right in there. We don't remove anything. It's under two hours to install. It makes the ability now to be a plug-in hybrid. What we hope this accomplishes is that other organizations walk away from here having had the experience of test driving and looking at the types of technologies actually being used in Hamilton and Toronto and have the confidence to start using it in their own fleets as well. Now is that the best use of your municipal tax dollars? As hard as it may be to believe, I've got something to say about that. That's later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, not so long ago, Audi were down and all but out, but they're back swinging and nothing shows quite how hard they're punching than this S4 and its even punchier sibling, the RS4.
All too often, buying a wagon means giving up the joy of driving. In simple terms, the practical side means that all else comes a distant second. Body roll is an ever-present companion, understeer is never too far away, and as for acceleration, well, many feel as though they're about to rear-end the front bumper because it's pulling away at such a leisurely rate. When it comes to the S4, take these guiding principles and throw them away, as far away as is humanly possible. Sure, practicality is part of the S4's overall package, because it will carry 15.6 cubic feet of your finest with the seats up, and 47.8 with them folded flat. But this is where the practical wagon disappears, and the sports car comes to the fore. When it came to the pylon test, this S4 ate it alive, and you know what? It all boils down to the basics. To begin with, a stiff chassis, a sophisticated suspension, the right-sized rubber, and a good all-wheel drive system that sends a little more power to the rear wheels. That makes this thing feel like a rear-drive car without sacrificing all-wheel drive. Now, when you do manage to completely get it wrong, there's a good electronic stability program. The bottom line here, this S4 demonstrates just how good the modern automobile really is. The combination of these basics makes for an extraordinary car. There is almost no body roll and understeer is a distant memory. The primary reason for this is the all-wheel drive system. In the S4's case, 40% of the power is directed to the front wheels, 60% reaches the road through the massive 235 40R18 rear tyres, which gives it the rear drive feel. However, if either the front or rear wheels begin to slip, the Quattro system automatically splits the power 50-50 which means that this muscle car, well, it's more than capable of dealing with a good old-fashioned Canadian winter when equipped with snow tyres. You know, when you get into the S4, you get everything you expect from Audi. Now, being a driver's car, tilt and telescopic steering wheel, combine that with a fully articulated driver's seat and you can set the right driving position. You also get some much nicer carbon fibre trim, nav system and all the toys you want. The single biggest improvement is in the seats. These Recaros, well, they hug the driver without being confining. The biggest improvement, however, they splay out through the shoulder area so they give you all the support you need when you're out playing automotive hooligan. Powering the S4 is a 4.2-litre V8 that churns out 340 horsepower and 302 pound-feet of torque at just 3,500 RPM. Fire this lot through a slick-shifting six-speed manual box and that all-wheel drive system, and the S4 burns its way to 100 kilometers an hour in 5.4 seconds, making it one of the fastest wagons in the world. The steering and brakes follow this lead. The steering is razor-sharp without feeling darty on the highway, while the enormous rotors scrub off speed at an alarming rate. You know, for those where enough really isn't quite enough, you can trade this S4 in at its 340 horsepower V8 and pick up an RS4. Now, when you do that, well, it brings 420 horsepower. The result, it's blindingly quick because each one of those stallions, well, it has to pull less than four kilograms of car, which makes it incredibly fast. How fast? Try less than five seconds from rest to 100K. Along with those 420 stallions comes a very welcome 318 pound-feet of torque, 90% of which clocks in at 2250 RPM. This is enough grunt to take you to 200 kilometers an hour in 16.6 seconds. To ensure the right handling characteristics, the RS4 also earns Audi's dynamic ride control suspension. Here, the left and right front shocks are diagonally linked to the rear shocks. This dials out 99.9% .9 all body roll without meaning the ride is too harsh for everyday driving. It also sits 30 millimeters lower, has bigger fender flares and some of the best brakes in the business. Absolutely awesome is the only way to describe the ride. You know, this Audi S4 it is a simply marvelous tool and it boils down to one simple fact. It solves an age-old dilemma. On the one hand, you've got family commitments, so you need a station wagon, but you don't want to give up the joy of driving a truly sporty car. Here it is. If you take the RS4, which unfortunately only comes in a sedan version, well, it ratchets everything that this car does so well, 
and it pumps them up quite a lot. Now to all of those people say, but you can't use 340 or 420 horsepower. Well, before you condemn it, I suggest you try it. Good intentions and then I I know I know I I soon yes absolutely I'm sure Mark would definitely uh, agree with that we're here to talk about the Be Car Care Wear campaign. Pennzoil Quaker State's one of the founding sponsors of this campaign. A lot of uh, vehicle owners today are not doing the preventive maintenance they should be doing on their vehicles. Uh, the cars are so good that as soon as you know they start every morning for them. So it's a real issue when they break down and then they have to get their wallet out for sure. They should be going by the owner's manual and abiding by the preventive maintenance schedule at the severe rating. Uh, oil changes are the biggest thing. People are extending their oil drains too long, getting sludging in the engine. It costs some fuel economy as well. Things like air filters, they should be changing the air filter. That'll cost them 10% in fuel economy. Mm -hmm. This is the lungs of your engine. That allows your engine to breathe so you get the proper mixture of fuel and air. So there's lots of things that consumers should be doing. We've been touring across Canada, uh, just talking to consumers about the need to maintain their cars. Wonderful. So and of course we need to, we were talking about also cleaning up your glass and Clean your inside glass of your window as sure. well too. Uh, absolutely. So good inside of your car. Glass Thank you. I am just, uh, probably the consummate car guy. I'm a real car nut. Uh, they call me the lunatic fringe because I'm always at the car. I probably wash my car than most people shower actually. My wife is always at me uh, vacuuming, waxing, that kind of thing. The oil is always changed. The wiper blades are always in top notch shape. Uh, it's just the thing that I do all the time. Have done for years since being a kid. My car's out back there. Sure, really bring it over. <laughs>are allowed to come in. We're taking care of over 220, 230 vehicles, uh, plus uh, some high-end motorcycles. We will start the cars every two weeks. We'll trickle charge their battery, so the cars are always fully charged. We run them every two weeks on an indoor circuit. People need this service. Anybody who has a car who doesn't have a place to put it in the off season while they're traveling um, during renovations of a house it's a big crowded city condominiums are being built everywhere you look parking spots downtown twenty to thirty thousand dollars for a spot guys got two three cars four cars he can't drive them all he's got an investment he, he what's he gonna do with them he doesn't want to sell them he needs to put them away somewhere in a safe, secure environment. My garage is is full and uh, it becomes a little dangerous for the car since it's parked for the winter time. You can get uh, nicks or bangs or, or people coming in and out of the garage. So actually over here it's safer for the car and it makes me feel much more comfortable. We have a vast array of, of very interesting cars at Auto Vault Canada. Uh, ranging from Packards from the 30s up to you know Thunderbirds in the 50s and uh, there's actually a Packard from the 50s that's so rare it has leather trim on the outside of the doors. Very interesting cars. You want to keep that car out of the elements for sure. A lot of these cars probably could be driven in the winter but these are prized possessions of people. So even though a Porsche with a set of snows would be very capable in the winter, people that own them just can't bear to see that car run through a Canadian winter salt and slush, I think it just would hurt them. It would hurt me. Earlier we saw that Toyota Prius with the extra aftermarket battery that would allow you to drive 30 miles on the electric motor alone. Well, you ready for this? That battery is worth about 12 grand. 
They hope to bring the price down to about $10,000 for consumers. But hey, I can buy a lot of gas with $10,000. And that's why governments have to lead the way, buy these products, and hopefully bring the price down. And another thing about hybrids, who's going to fix them? Well, let's ask our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, do you think you want to own a hybrid one day past the warranty? I heard the battery for some of those hybrids is over $8,000. Now they say it should last the life of the vehicle, but do you want to be the guy holding the ownership the day it goes? Uh, I'm thinking that would pretty much write it off after it's about six or seven years old. This week, Brad, we want to introduce our new uh, long-term tester, the 2006 Honda Ridgeline. Now we had it for a week last fall for the truck of the year and we picked it as our truck of the year. But you know what? I didn't even realize that week just how much utility was hidden in this thing until you start living with it day by day. And it's just amazing how much extra room is gained back by this under the bed storage. In the back here it's lockable, it's waterproof. And even though the box is very short on this truck, with all that extra storage in there, if you utilize it properly, it gains you back a lot of storage. Some great tie-down cleats in the back of this truck for tying down your cargo. And a couple of guys mentioned to me that it was awful high here at the sides for lifting cargo over. But you know what? You never want to do that because that's how you beat up the side of your truck. You put it in through the tailgate. And the fact that it's so high defeats you from doing that. You've got a great skid plate here that takes uh, any abrasions from items that you're carrying. like to see a few tie downs along here. I'm sure somebody will have an accessory to take care of that. Now in the back, another thing in the utility department that's just amazing is how much storage there is underneath the rear seat. Now you wouldn't think that big toolbox could sit there and have the seat go down, but if you watch, the seat will go down and lock and completely clear that toolbox with a couple of inches to spare. So if you pack all your extra uh, tie downs and booster cables and things like that carefully in the right size boxes they'll all go underneath that seat so when you've got extra passengers in the vehicle you can still have the seat down and have that stuff out of the way without putting it in the back and getting it wet or snowed on. In the driver's compartment great utility here as well the center console is absolutely amazing lots of bins on the right side with ledges so that you can store small things like your transponder and not have them falling out. Great little truck to drive, really drives great on the highway. Five speed automatic so it gets the engines just turning about 2,000 RPM at 110 kilometers and that's V8 territory when you think about it. You wouldn't think a V6 would have enough muscle to pull that kind of gearing but this one certainly does. Three and a half liter variable valve timing V6. Uh, really great fuel economy too. One thing I didn't like is this hood height. You can see that the hood doesn't really open all that far. It's capable of opening much further which gets you more, a lot more light into the engine bay for working but that's not a big deal. You'll figure out a prop arrangement to uh, get you that uh, that ac access to the engine bay when, if and when you do have to service it. And one thing, you know, everybody knows I've been a big fan of V8 trucks, but with gas over a buck a liter, I'm really enjoying the economy that's in this Ridgeline. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006. We have a rollover vehicle which was donated to us by GM. We took this rollover vehicle and we put it onto a trailer and we simulate what it's like at 40 kilometers an hour if you're in your vehicle not wearing your seatbelt. It's fairly graphic. Usually what happens is the mannequin that's inside will fly out. We do two demonstrations. We do one with the mannequin hooked up with the seat belt showing what will happen. It still moves around. We also have a baby in a baby seat. It's not hooked up properly. Most people we're finding nowadays are just taking the, the baby seat, putting it right into the vehicle without hooking it up properly and it also demonstrates that. I couldn't say that everybody will ever wear all their seat belts all the time. It would be nice, it'd make our job easier at times.
Well, it looks like a lot of Canadian municipalities are jumping on that hybrid bandwagon. And they're not alone. A lot of people are. In fact, some experts say that on a well-to-wheel basis, the hybrid is still the best way to go for fuel consumption. But I'm all for being a friend of the environment. My question is, can we afford to be a friend to the environment? I mean, if a hybrid costs $6,000 more than a comparable similar car with conventional technology, well, 6000 bucks buys you a lot of fuel. I mean, seriously, look at the payback on that. I did the calculation for one vehicle. It was going to take 28 years to pay for itself, even if it's six years or eight years. That's a long time. The question I have, if you really want to be a friend of the environment, if you got 6000 bucks to put towards the cause, you're better off putting another R20 insulation in your attic. You probably still have 4,000 bucks left over. The other thing the municipalities are doing with respect to hybrids, which I find a bit weird, some of them are allowing them to use the high occupancy vehicle lanes on the freeway. This is so they can go really fast with those Hummers and those big pickup trucks. But a hybrid doesn't get better fuel economy on the highway. It only gets it in the city. So why don't they ban them from the high occupancy lanes and only allow them to run in the city? Well, that would make too much sense. And there's other perks too. Governments are giving them tax incentives and rebates. What about the guy in the smart car with a tiny little diesel engine? Or even the guy in the Golf Jetta diesel? He's getting a lot of great fuel economy too. He's not getting any brakes. You know, to me, the bottom line is the dollar. You want to save fuel? Raise the price and let the market decide what technology to use. But there's one advantage of being a hybrid driver. Susan Sarandon might become your best friend. For a guy my age, that means a lot. I'm Jim Kent. You know, there are some cities with idling bylaws, but what I don't get is, if idling is so bad, which it is, why do we have drive throughs I mean, forget the pollution these cars are creating. Whatever happened to the days you got out of your car, you went in, said good morning, bought your coffee, and you were on the way, and usually that's even quicker than sitting in the drive through Did somebody say, lazy? Don't get me started. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.